Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. Hey, lovers of small businesses and good stories in general. Welcome to episode 114 of Small Business War Stories. And today I had a chance to sit down with Leah Meckling. and She is the executive director of South Pop. It's the South Austin Museum of Popular Culture. And it's here in Austin, and she is a curator. Her and her team curate the history of music, of popular culture in Austin uh, over the decades. And they have an incredible, incredible art collection and poster collection that uh, showcases what's been going on in Austin over the decades, how it's evolved, how it's changed. And they are the keepers of the torch, if you will, uh, passing down and making sure that there is a voice for the culture of Austin. And it's a really interesting story. They are a nonprofit, so uh, there are some really interesting and different aspects of running that. Uh, but we talk about uh, you know all the funky things that happen and we talk about all kinds of things that happen to them. We talk about uh, broken pipes. We talk about uh, how they raise money from their donors and other funky stories uh, from the uh, past decades of making sure that they are keeping the history of Austin culture alive. Go check out our new website at smallbusinesswarstories.com. Tell us what you think about this episode. And uh, yeah, we'd love to uh, hear if you have any um any ideas, we'd love to hear them. Without further ado, let's get into today's episode with Leah Meckling of South Pop, the South Austin Museum of Popular Culture. And we are live here in beautiful Austin, Texas. And today I have the pleasure and honor to sit down with Leah Meckling, who is the executive director of the South Pop Museum. Hi. Welcome to the show. So glad to be here. It's exciting to be here. It's uh, so it, it, South Pop is a short name. It's like the South Austin Museum of Popular Culture. Is that that right? is correct. All right. It's so long though. We wanted something like a nickname. Something that has more pop. No pun That's intended. right. <laughs> awesome. So th- this is a very unique space uh, that encompasses or, 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 or tries to showcase a lot of the history, uh, cultural history of Austin. Um, Tell me a little bit about the history of this place. How, how did this place come about? It's in a prime location here on South Lamar. How, how did this place come to be? It is in a prime location, and that's because one of our founders and donors owns the property. So he's been very generous in giving us a place to house South Pop. We opened in 2004 after about 20 years of discussion of why music posters were an art genre into themselves. We'd been collecting as a group since the mid-60s, posters, photographs, backstage passes, tickets, all of that associated ephemera. And we really wanted to have a place where people could see that and be educated about what happened in Austin that created a culture shift starting in about the mid-60s that help this town bridge a gap and become really um, an artistic hub, both in visual arts and music. Okay. And went on to become the city that we know today. But a lot of people don't know that history part, so. Is the mid-60s, is that the Cosmic Cowboy area, or is that even before that? That's a little before. That's, uh, there was psychedelic music going on and rock and roll, and of course still a huge folk scene, and... But as you got into the early 70s, things were evolving, and Willie Nelson moved back to town. Uh, People were experimenting with different sounds, and that's how the the cosmic cowboy scene grew and evolved. And of course, it was really big for five, ten years, and then things morphed again got it so how do we cover those fifth those five decades in three minutes so if you go so you go in the 60s you get um you know part of the folk and rock and roll movement 
Cosmic Cowboy movement in the 70s, how would you encompass that? How would oh, you then we started it? moving into new wave and punk. But remember that blues and rock and roll and jazz were a continuous theme through it all. Right. So you got the 13th floor elevators. So, yeah, psychedelic music in the 60s. And they were really front runners. They and Shiva's headband okay. were very important, although the Elevators are truly the iconic band and had a very dramatic up and down career, a short career. Yeah. They, some, some of their uh, stories highlighted in the uh, Sonic Highways uh, yes. series from uh, Dave Grohl on HBO, right? That is correct. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's how I first learned about them, uh, and it's uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of history. And how how do you see? Um, so for, first of all, let's talk about what it's like. What for for our listeners who are not here, uh, what what is this space? So you have you have here some archives, and then you also have a showroom. What what, what is what is we this do? Space? We have an exhibit space where we will put up our main exhibit they usually run between 8 and 12 14 weeks and we have another room where we show some examples from our permanent collection uh, also in our little hallway also in our bathroom also in our workroom um, we have about 2500 square feet all told uh, some of it is devoted to storing the collection because we don't have room to put it all out nor should you things shouldn't be out in the different kinds of light for very long periods of time. If oh, is that right? Yeah, if you want to really preserve their color and the paper. and So we try to rotate things around and then keep what we're not using in the dark. Got it, got it. So that's what these uh, large racks next to us yeah, here. Yeah, the with, flat uh, files. Is, is that what they're called, flat they files? They are. Okay. And so all those drawers are packed full of things. We have about 350 Frank Kozik posters. Okay. He was a young guy that came here in the 80s as a teenager and was artistic and hung out with the artists that were primarily responsible for the posters for the Armadillo World Headquarters. And through them, he learned to design posters and do silk screening. But he really took it to the next level mm -hmm. and uh, got in on the punk scene and really loud rock and roll and got hired by big touring bands to do their posters. He was really on quite a roll right up until the year 2000 when he quit postering. Mm. He lives in San Francisco now, but he designs these amazing plastic toys mm -hmm. uh, like smoking rabbits and he does busts of uh, dictators which have proven to be really popular. Okay. But he was like oh, the... Oh, I think I've seen this. I bet you have. Yeah, like now you say that. Tongue, yeah. And he even did like the characters from the movie A Clockwork Orange. Okay. But Frank really bridged the generational gap between the guys working in the 60s and 70s to the artists that were really up and coming in the 80s and 90s. So you brought up the Armadillo World Headquarters. Yes. For some of our audience who may not know what that is, what uh, tell tell us about the Armadillo uh, World Headquarters. The Armadillo World Headquarters was a music venue um, at the corner of South First Street and Barton Springs Road, housed in an old armory that had the capacity of fifteen hundred people, and they. Um, booked in a really eclectic mix of bands. We would take chances on bands nobody heard of. Uh, the guys that did the booking would pair unusual musicians together, like uh, Vassar Clements, a country fiddler, with Jean-Luc Ponty, a French uh, violin jazz player, and really drew a diverse crowd. We could get the hippies and the rednecks to come see Willie, and there weren't any fights. Right, right. Didn't uh, I think there's a there's a conversation on record between Willie and Whalen where Whalen didn't believe that that would happen, that they wouldn't get in a fight, right? That's right. But it all worked <clears throat> out, and it yeah. certainly changed Willie and Whalen and several other people's career trajectory. Okay, and so it's an iconic venue. It was around for about. It, Thir 30 yeah. years? Uh, 10 years. It opened on August 7th, 1970, and it closed December 31st, 1980. But it was reopened. 
No, it's never reopened, but uh, one of the people that was um, a leader in the organization, Eddie Wilson, uh -huh. had a restaurant in the south part of town called Threadgills. Right. Often referring to it as Threadgill's World Headquarters. Oh, okay, that's where the confusion and is. And he decorated <clears throat> the inside with all kinds of artwork and imagery from the Armadillo World Headquarters. Got so when it. you were in that restaurant, you really had the feel of what had been represented at the club. But it wasn't the same thing. It wasn't, no, no, it, it wasn't even the same location, was it? Uh, it was or down it was? the street, actually. Okay, the yeah. Threadgill's <clears throat> was in the former Maramont Cafeteria, which was about uh, half a block mm -hmm. on the same block. Yeah. From the Dillo. And unfortunately, Threadgill's just closed not too long ago. Uh, yes, because of um, lease difficulties yeah. with the building's owners. So they are still open at their north location on North Lamar. It's, you know, awesome. Same yeah. food, same a lot of the same people. Okay. So they still here. Okay, sounds good. Just not that location. Yeah. That's good. That's good. So um, I guess this highlights a lot of the um, somewhat controversial but also inevitable change that happens right in in Austin and not just Austin. Like, I think I think this this impacts every city. I mean, you were talking about San Francisco. San, you know, you, you go from Jimi Hendrix playing uh, the Panhandle <clears throat> to uh, you know, which is an, a, a, a kind of a little offshoot of Golden Gate Park in, in San Francisco. Uh, I want to say that was in the early 70s that he did that. Uh, or late 60s, early 70s. It must have been late 60s. Late 60s. He... Oh, that's right. That's right. He was dead by then. That's right. That's right. That's a good, that's a good point. And I should know that. Uh, okay. But yeah, he... Uh, so him and Jerry Garcia and, and the Grateful Dead and, and, and Janis Joplin to now San Francisco is a very different place uh, with uh, the art scene is, is, is not what it was. Um, how do you see this change here in Austin and how what do you think is a way to manage the growth and and what do you see your role in in kind of uh, telling the story and and continuing to push forward um, the the uh, you know the art scene here in in, uh, in Austin well one thing that I've learned since coming to Austin in 1974 as a student Austin has always been a city of change. Some change people liked, some change people didn't. In the mid 70s, a grandfather of a friend who was a native Austinite told me, that was 1974, and this man said, Austin is ruined. You should have been here in the 30s and 40s. That's when people knew how to let their hair down and have a good time and really let loose. And that stuck with me because as you move through time and things change and everyone complains about the change, it's really not productive because complaining doesn't make things better. It's, you know, good to stand up to the man, but at the end of the day, how do you feel when you've just complained all day about something? Yeah, so it really just, behooves just, us you just all invite negative energy. to uh, find some positive ways to deal with it and educate people. People are moving here uh, so quickly, it's become unaffordable, which has changed the art and music scene. So I think the pressure just needs to keep being applied to the city officials and developers to find ways to create affordable housing. And, you know, performers and artists are primarily on my mind, but for everybody. Yeah. Uh, there's people here, people who work in the service industry, people just starting out after graduating from school. They need affordable places to live, too. Yeah. So one thing that we try to do is provide a place where people can come and see how people had been creative and how they are being creative, because we display work by people who are active right now. We reach out to younger artists and musicians and invite them to come be here and perform and hang out with us and we get a lot of out-of-town visitors so we really try to educate them to what the city's about you know we're open we're welcoming we let people join in we're not yeah clickish yeah and you know it's why people want to move here so if they understand better yeah they can become part of the community and that is a great seg to your non-secret secret society. Do you want to talk about Ooh, that? Oh, the Order of the Sacred <laughs> Varmint. It is our semi-sort of secret society with no discernible purpose. 
it's something special we do for our members and um, some non-members that we deem a worthy. It's a special sticker and we give those out at different events and then have a special swearing in program and um, I don't know we band together to do things like talk about throwing the scooters in the nearest dumpsters because we're <laughs> sick of them uh, tongue-in-cheek of course yeah, yeah. but we uh, want to encourage people to get out there and listen to live music and go see art and that's one way we have of talking to people about doing that is yeah. making them members yeah yeah, so I'm a proud member of, of South Pop and uh, as of uh, last week. We're so glad you're yeah. our newest member. We're so Is glad that to right? have you. Yeah, That's no, right. Nobody signed on after me? Wow. We need to bring some more folks in. Come on down. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit more about the events that you throw and how you, uh, so you, we've, you, know, you want to play a role in educating the community. Uh, but I want to I want to touch on two things. One is uh, events, which is how you physically bring people together. And also after that, I do want to touch on given the way technology is evolving and the uh, methods that exist to spread messages uh, more widely, are there other things that you're doing in terms of uh, you know, creating videos and things online that people can maybe, uh, if somebody from Norway or from New Zealand or from Mozambique is interested in, in some of the uh, things that you're showcasing here that they can uh, you know, uh, access that? Uh, as a matter of fact, our programming involves, of course, the visual art that we have in the exhibits, but also booking Austin bands that um, a lot of them have been here for decades and are stars in their own right, but come here and play on our outside stage. and. We have uh, one way do, we do that is with our free concert series every last Sunday of the month. Our vice president and director of special programs, Freddie Kirch, arranges for the music. He knows everybody and has done such a fabulous job booking bands to come play here. And not necessarily bands that are well known to the public, which is so great because it gives people something new yeah. to discover. Yeah. At the same time, they're hearing people that they've been listening to for a long time, like Van Wilkes. Okay. Um, who's a, an amazing guitar player. You, know, you guys should book uh, the Reverend Few. They're friends of mine, the band here in town, and they um, they're spectacular. Actually, Nick, who is their lead guitarist, was on this show two episodes ago, talking about the uh, barriers that we put up for ourselves as creators and how we get in our own way. So I encourage you. And he actually sings an original song at the end of that episode. It's. Uh, but yeah, that's well, a, a plug we'll for... Well, we'll need to visit with them and exactly. get in with they're, Freddie so they can have a discussion. Yeah, Freddie's awesome. I met, I met him the other day and uh, today as well. So. so a project that we did a couple of years ago that we're, st we're wanting to add on to, it's called 50 Over 50, mm -hmm. where we took photographs of and did recorded interviews of musicians who were over the age of 50. And we actually did 67 interviews of Austin musicians over 50. And we have those available online to listen to. Wow. They're really so You should start your own podcast. Well, maybe we should. Yeah, well you can interview <laughs> different uh, Austin, like people who highlight Austin culture, and uh, then you can release that uh, and, and have all these stories out there. Well, I'll have to get some more advice from you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You the I, I the only I will say this: the only secret to podcasting is that you really want to have to just keep doing it because it's easy. Practice I, makes perfect. Well, it's not, it's not even just that. It's like the the a lot of people want to start a podcast and want to do it, uh, but it's consistency and you have to stay. You know, like we're you know over two years in right now, and you just every single Wednesday episode comes out. You know, and you have to. That's great. Uh, you just have to really want to do it. Dedication is what it takes on any project because if you do nothing chances are you'll still be another year older the next year but if you do something yeah regularly look what you can accumulate like you with over a hundred podcasts yeah no i love doing this because i love you know getting all the stories from people and uh for for me mm -hmm. it's uh it's it's a fascinating uh endeavor for sure Social media has really presented a good way for us to communicate with people away from Austin. We have a large following in Europe and the Far East. Um, 
and they do go to our website and look at everything we have there. We've got not as many as we would like, but we have videos of our different event performances, mm -hmm. and we try to go and take photos of everything that's in our exhibits and post that. So we have found social media to be a big help in spreading our message and the imagery just clear around the world. Now, do you, um, I mean, so this is an interesting time to talk about you being a nonprofit, right? So while you're a nonprofit, you also, uh, revenues are not a bad thing because they help you keep the lights on. They help you run your programs. They help you do things. Are you currently using all of those channels to amplify your message and then also sell things like, you know, T-shirts or, or posters or, or things of that sort? Yes, we sell posters and T-shirts and albums and 45s. And, okay. Um, there's probably always more, but we rely on donations and grants primarily okay. and memberships it goes a long way to helping fulfill our program needs it is a constant struggle we're always looking for the next grant to apply for and get money because it's never guaranteed from grant cycle to grant cycle you have to keep applying so we've been doing that now for about 12 years and have been fairly successful but it really takes Many pieces of the pie yeah. to make the whole thing. Right, right. So have you, um, a, a, do you actively try to imp increase, uh, you know, revenues from sales and content and that such that you don't rely on grants as much? How do you, how do you well, think about that? Well, as a nonprofit, you know, you can, it gets complicated because there's different kinds of money you can make and different kinds that you don't want you to make so that you retain your nonprofit status. Tell me more about that. I actually am not familiar. So I, we've had some nonprofits in the past. I mentioned it early, before we started rolling the Muscle Souls Music Foundation. It's about episode, I think, I want to say 30 or 40. But uh, um, what, what, what are some of the things that you have to deal with as a nonprofit that most small businesses maybe don't know about? Well, uh, income stream, ba it, it's just... It's the same but different. Okay. You know, everybody's trying to bring money in to keep, like, paying people and getting supplies and advertising. But for a nonprofit, it's a little more complicated. And you can, you can make money, but it should be set up through an associated entity that does primarily the retailing. And then they use the net proceeds to turn around and fund the nonprofit. Okay, so the nonprofit itself has limitations as to what it can sell? Yes. Oh. Usually like gift shops and big museums, they're sort of an internal separate entity. Mm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So that that means okay, that that does add some complication. But that said, you could uh, I mean so for you example, can, and we would like to. More money is always better. Yeah. We just want to make sure that we treat that money the way it needs to be treated versus yeah. the money that's coming in from donations, grants, grants right. and the memberships. So, I mean, maybe the, the museum gift shop model, like let's say, uh, I don't know, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, right? They have, I mean, I think they had, now they even have their own furniture line or something like that. They are amazing and something we can only dream yeah. of yeah, emulating. Well, dreams but, is what... You know, but look at them. They're so much bigger than us, and their budget has to be exponentially yeah. bigger. So they're still faced with the same struggles. Yeah, of course. Of um, course. But, you know, they can Probably charge even. $25 admission, and yeah. we can't. Yet. <laughs> Yet. That's right. <laughs> I like it. I like. It. Can you think of a time when things went really wrong here, and what did you do about it? Like a time when things were a disaster. Oh well, we did have one crippling event a few years ago. Oh yeah. We developed a water leak here, mm. and had a hard time finding the source. So finally. A plumber with an x-ray machine was sent over and he started out on the side of the building where our neighbors 
Planet K reside and couldn't find anything and came over to our side and I thought it was a joke. I was laughing and oh no, 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 out in the hallway in our main exhibit space was a crack in the main wastewater pipe. So they had to dig a 20 foot long, four feet wide, three foot deep trench. Ugh breaking up the slab to get down in there to replace 50-year-old wastewater pipe, which, by the way, was made of, like, paper covered in creosote. Uh-huh. So they replaced all that, but, you know, we couldn't hold our exhibit, so we had oh. to get in touch with our the city of Austin, our grant liaison, and let them know what happened. We sent them photos, and... It was distressing, but they were so awesome, and we got to postpone what we were doing, okay. and um, it all did work out, and the repair was made in a lovely manner, and we've never had any pro problem, but okay. that was kind of a huge hitch in our go get along. Yeah. And then the other thing that had come up was uh, we were lucky enough to hold a Gilbert Shelton exhibit a few years ago. He's the... Um, author of the Furry Freak Brothers underground comic book series, very famous guy, okay. lives in Paris now. Uh -huh. His work sells for a lot of money. Uh -huh. He was here the day of the show. We were going back around and checking everything that we put up on the wall against our inventory list, and there was a drawing that was gone. Ugh. And it was valued at $12,000, and we looked and looked and looked and couldn't find it, and he arrived and I was gonna go tell him we lost it. I even took a Valium actually, had a little glass of wine. <laughs> and then we found it. You found it. And so uh, we from that we developed another system okay. to use as we're putting things up to make sure we know the location of it in the exhibit. And I have to say we've never lost anything. All right. Sounds good. Well, I mean, it sounds like those sound like things that happen in the course of business. And and for, for the pipe issue, you didn't have any damage to any of your No, no, just, no. Nothing was, was like, damaged. No. It's like deep underneath. And we were really lucky to be able to ascertain fairly quickly what was wrong and then get yeah. it taken care of. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the, yeah, that's, uh, you know, part of the game. It's the things that keep, mm -hmm. uh, keep life fun, right? That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's awesome. What do you envision for, for the future? So what's next? Where, where is South Pop 10 years from now, and how have you further continued along the mission to... Uh, well, I'm hoping in 10 years we're in a bigger facility with good storage and, I don't know, a $20,000 scanner and lots of staff <laughs> and still plugging along mining Austin culture history and uh, highlighting the new things that are going on in town. Okay. I just there's so much to look at and talk about, illustrate, share yeah. with people. I can't see us ever running out of ideas of things to do. Yeah, and this city certainly attracts. I mean, it's uh, it's attracting lots of different types of folks now, but definitely attracts a creative class and people who are it has an energy about it that uh, you know prompts yes. pe people. Who We're so lucky. We have five universities in the area. And truly, the constant influx of young people, their creative minds and energy is what keeps Austin moving along. Yeah. Uh, many people come here to go to school and then tr find a way to stay. Yeah. Uh, the generations seem to work pretty well together, too, because at any one of our gatherings, you'll see the old guard, but you'll also see a bunch of young people. Yeah. Um, you know, everything old becomes new again. Right. Right. And you know, it's it's funny like you said about uh, the story about you should have been here in the thirties because I think everybody talks about, you know, oh Austin's ruined now, you should have been here in the eighties or Austin's ruined now, you should have been here in the nineties or oh two thousand five, that's when that's Austin it. really went down. <laughs> everybody thinks that the time yeah. when they were young was the best. Yeah. For yeah. some people, it was probably the best time of their life. Right. So they uh, they uh, they kind of uh, cast a, uh, that glow on the whole mm -hmm. era in the town. You know, memory and the truth are related, but they're not twins, and we tend to look at things in the past with a rosy lens. Yeah. 
what are some things that you're excited about today that are going on in Austin? What are some projects, ideas, things that, you, that excite you today? Hmm. Well, there are uh, so many more new graphic artists that are really getting involved with the music scene. There's several um, organizations of young poster or graphic artists there's the decoder ring concern that's about 12 artists that are really doing a lot the rural rooster bearded lady satch um, they are really coming forward and making a statement with their new more graphic design of their artwork okay what about music and is there anything music well I, you know, on any given day, there's probably 80 places here in town you can go hear music of un, not only recognized artists, but the young and upcoming ones. And, um, and of course, now I can't think of the names of the people <laughs> I want to mention because I'm old. No, but no, no, no. They, just, there's really a whole fresh thing going on. You just got to get out there and see it. And that's what keeps me excited. Yeah. And... Just the different groups working together, it keeps everybody like still moving forward in their songwriting and performing and young people coming in and playing with an older band and vice versa. Um, yeah. I can't think of their No, names. that's okay. I mean, there's plenty of, what, what are some of your favorite venues? Where, where do you usually oh. find yourself? Well, I love Antones. Yeah. Home of the Blues. Yeah. And the Continental Club, and Wero's, and mm -hmm. Sea Boys, yeah. the Evangeline Cafe. Um, I haven't been to Stubbs in a long time, but that's a nice venue downtown. Yeah. No. Sex and Pub wrong. does great shows there. I yeah, really think they're it's here. walking distance. Their early shows are always free, yeah. and we always recommend that to visitors who come to see us. Yeah, I got to play there one. a few months ago for the first so, time. It's an incredible room. Cross section of bands that play there. Oh yeah, oh yeah, very very broad. I mean, Willie Nelson's played there, right? and Towns played there at one point. I, I don't know that. I imagine that could be true. Oh, yeah, probably at, for towns at the previous location. Oh, there was a previous location uh -huh. for this accent. I didn't know that. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. I, I know that there's a photo of Willie on the stage, and I don't know if that's the old or the new location. It has to be the old one. The, no, the new one. I'm just wrong about so many things yeah, today. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need lots we of have, help. We have our music expert, Freddie, giving us hand signals here, telling us what, uh, you know, See? helping us Told you, Freddie, things. we're yeah. going to need you after all. Yeah, yeah. the Cactus Cafe. You, you go oh, there. the Cactus Cafe, yes. I'm, yeah. It's a great place. That's awesome. That's awesome. Very cool. Where can people find you? So if you are interested in learning more about what you're doing, what are your social media handles? What's your address here in Austin? Where, what can people, um, it, obviously, if, if you know folks are visiting Austin, it's very much uh, worth a visit. Uh, where, where well, thanks. Well, we're at 1516B South Lamar, right here in South Austin, for our physical location. And we're online at www.southpop.org. And we're on Facebook, easy to find, South Pop or South Austin Museum of Popular Culture. I know nothing about Twitter, so I can't be helpful with that, but yeah. I know we do it. It's uh, someone younger than I takes care of that. And what are your hours? You, you, have, you have some interesting hours, right? We do. We're open yeah. Thursday through Sunday, 1 to 6, or by appointment and chance. Or by appointment and chance. And, but you also have, actually, outside of, there's an exhibit that is actually quite, it's permanent, and it's, it's really interesting in its own right, uh, in the parking lot. You want to talk a little bit yes, more about Yes, our that? memorial wall. Well, one of the founders of South Pop, Henry Gonzalez, in 2004, wanted to do something special for his friend, Ken Featherston, who was killed in 1975. So for Day of the Dead, we put up a photo of Ken outside on a fence that was there and did a little decorating. And as time went by, we thought, there are so many people who been in the counterculture scene that haven't been recognized by mainstream Austin that should be remembered and honored for their contributions to Austin's culture. So 
we started putting up uh, photos of folks who are deceased, who are photographers, artists, musicians, philanthropists, mm -hmm. a couple of ne'er do wells just because they were fun. Um, just a really wide variety of people, and we have their photo with a little paragraph about them yeah. and we have an annual celebration the first sunday of november where we add more photos and um really talk about everybody who's there already and just enjoy being together uh, we've been doing that now since 2004 so okay. for 15 years yeah and it yeah it's, it's an amazing wall i mean for the most part people i've seen a couple of uh, photos that people have uh, unfortunately taken but for the most part yes who knows why people do that yeah um so we're working to replace those yeah. and I, our friend towns is one of them we just redid okay you redid towns okay and that must so have been recent because that but they did the one space that's empty yeah somebody pried it off the wall yeah that's annoying so we're um updating the photos as we can and we're transitioning the very first ones we did were simply brightly colored wooden frames with a laminated photo in them that we put on the wall yeah. and now we've progressed to producing these metal uh, plates that are printed with a material that's uv resistant and holds up better and all right so we're hoping by the end of this year we've transitioned everybody to that new format. That's awesome. And you also have, I mean, there's some really cool art outside in the parking lot too. So you have uh, the cars with plants coming out of them in the back. Yes, our cactus cars. Cactus we cars. love them. Yeah. And, and our mural on the stage painted by Carry On. And it's huge and colorful and is a wonderful backdrop for our musical performances. And the Loteria cards in the parking lot. Yes, Henry painted in the parking spaces. He painted them like Loteria cards. Yeah. And we're gonna start refreshing them. They take some wear and tear. I you bet, know? I bet. And then there's also the, the, the kind of motorcycle made out of motorcycle oh, yeah, parts. The that, hog. The hog, it looks like a hog. We are so lucky to have two pieces of Bob Wade art here. Daddy O. Wade okay. is an amazing sculptor, painter, drawer, a renaissance man, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, you know, his motto is, too much is not enough. <laughs> so he created the hog of steel out of different pieces and parts of motorcycles. And it is so cool because yeah. nothing in it is, like, really a pig. But when you put it all together, it looks like a hog riding a motorcycle yeah and then we have another one called longhorn tail that's the tail end of a airplane with the head of a longhorn that, how did i miss smoking where is, something where is that? right by the front door oh did i it's right next to the hog then yeah i don't, I don't know how i miss that around the corner in the front of the building we have a giant metal uh windmill okay that was created by bob's daughter rachel okay so uh, we kind of love the work of the Wade family. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I think it's really, really important, the work that you're doing here, uh, being a storyteller, somebody who continues to pass on the tradition and the stories that have made Austin and, uh, and Texas music what it is. So uh, thank you for, for all the work that you do. Thank you. And, uh, and yeah, it's been, a, it's been an honor to have you on the show. I'm so glad to be here with you, and it's, again, welcome as our newest member. It sounds good. As a mem What is a member of the Order of the Secret Varmint? The Order of the Sacred Varmint. Sacred Varmint. Okay, and that's, uh, and that's a reference to the armadillo, of course. Yes, it is. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pablo. Take care. Bye. Small Business War Stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. <laughs>